So welcome to the third day of this series of uh, three webinars uh, on the retrofitting of canals with geoscientics. So today we're going to speak of bank stabilization and erosion control. Uh, we had two excellent days yesterday with a very, very good attendance and uh, very interested dis discussions uh, and series of uh, of a question at the end, uh, it was very productive. So uh, today uh, we have again a series of excellent speakers and excellent presentation. Uh, we're going to start with Pietro Rimoldi, uh, who is uh, who who used to be a chairman of this technical committee on hydraulics and has a fantastic experience on this uh, topic. So before I introduce Pietro, I, wanna, I want to remind you, and I will do so a couple of times during the session, uh, we will address, uh, answer every question you, that may be asked at the end of the webinar. So in uh, about one hour and 45 minutes from now, we'll have a question and and uh, Q and A session finishing the series. So in the meantime, please enter any questions you may have in the, using the Q&A button, which is in the middle at the bottom of your screen, Q&A. Uh, please enter any questions you may have and uh, we will answer them at the end uh, of, of the webinar. So uh, Pietro obtained a degree in civil engineering in 1984 and started to work in the geoscientics industry in 1986. Since 1986, he has been involved in the development of new products and in many research projects related to geogenetics. He has designed several important projects around the world for soil reinforcement and stabilization, landfill, hydraulic applications, and erosion control. He's the author of more than 250 national and international publications. He has written books and design manuals for reinforced slopes and walls, basal reinforcement, veneer reinforcement, road and railway-based stabilization, geosynthetic drainage systems, and erosion control. He is a member of the International Council of the IGS. He has been the chairman of the Technical Committee on Hydraulics and is presently the chair of the Technical Committee on Reinforcement of the IGS. So Pietro, if you can present your information to us. Yes, thank you for the introduction, Eric. Uh, I share my screen. <clears throat> oh, God. Okay, can you see my screen now? Yes. Okay, um, so, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I will uh, uh, present now uh, this uh, overview of geosynthetic product for erosion control in uh, irrigation channel that will uh, also serve as introduction for the uh, next uh, presentation. Uh, why we are talking about uh, erosion control? So uh, just give a look uh, to the irrigation system in Egypt. Um, the uh, Egypt uh, irrigation system extends uh, some 1,200 kilometers from Aswan to the Mediterranean Sea and includes 13,000 kilometers of main public canals, 19,000 kilometers of secondary public canals, and almost 100,000 kilometers of tertiary private water courses called MESCAS that form the main distributaries to uh, farmers fields. Also, the, there is navigation in Egypt because uh, 
the Nile is navigable by sailing vessels and the shallow draft river boat as far south as uh, Aswan. Now, let's uh, see some examples of the uh, irrigation canals in Egypt. First of all, uh, I show the large uh, canals. The Ibrahimia Canal is an irrigation canal built in 1873. It supplies perennial irrigation to 2,300 square kilometers and flood irrigation to another 1,700 square kilometers. This 350 kilometer long canal is one of the largest artificial canals in the world, taking water directly from the Nile. And you can note that the banks, in this case, are fully vegetated. Another uh, historical canal is the Bar Yusef, the Canal of Joseph. It's a canal which connects the Nile River with Al Fayum, southwest of Cairo. The original canal is more than 3,000 years old. It goes back to the Bible time. In the picture, it can be noted that there are signs of erosion on the right bank, which is not vegetated. Now, some examples of medium uh, channels, and also in this case, you can see that there are situations with vegetated banks and other situation with uh, unvegetated banks. Uh, so the, the, the banks are uh, totally exposed to the uh, action of the, the water flow. These are example of uh, small uh, channels that uh, bring the water directly to the, to the farms. Also in this case, you can see that there are situation with uh, vegetated banks and other situation with totally unvegetated banks. And you can see that there are clear signs of uh, erosion on these uh, unvegetated banks. So uh, the erosion on uh, river and channel banks produced by the uh, shear stresses applied by the stream. If not properly addressed, erosion may cause significant issues for navigation and uh, human activities. Moreover, uncontrolled erosion may produce the failure of dikes with consequent flooding of surrounding areas. The water flowing river and channels produce shear stresses on the bottom and side banks, which are proportional to water depth and velocity. Such shear stresses can remove soil particles and excavate progressively deeper into the channel bottom and sides, which may lead to slope failure, as you can see in the, the picture uh, at the left. So channel bottom and sides can be protected by lining with different materials and particularly with geosynthetic, which is the topic of today. So erosion protection is essential for water courses for two main reasons. First, the necessary uh, cross-section must be guaranteed for easy navigation and for the safe discharge of design flow. Therefore, no deposit of material in the water course due to the transport of sediment or low slope instability shall be allowed to obstruct the regular water flow. Second, streams often cross densely populated areas, so the stability of the banks or river and canals is of particular importance. Therefore, it is necessary to foresee potential situation of instability and to provide protection measures in good time. The erosion of embankment and banks of canals and rivers can be produced by two main actions, the natural hydraulic forces originating from currents and waves and the hydraulic loads induced by navigation. In navigable channels, the dominant hydraulic load often derives from the currents and waves induced by the boats, intensified by the fact that the cross section of the water course is often small compared to the uh, submerged part of the ship. In natural waterways, the maximum hydraulic loads are reached during extreme water events. So we can use uh, uh, active protection for uh, uh, controlling or uh, uh, reducing erosion. This uh, active protection consists with structures for reducing the effects of the water flow, like longitudinal embankment, you see on the left picture, or perpendicular groins on the uh, right feature. Uh, the problem is that even these active uh, structures need to be protected against erosion with passive uh, measures. So let's consider the passive protection, 
which consists with increasing the resistance to water action. And often it is the only possible measure if no alteration of the action can be achieved. Comparison of cost can also lead to such a decision. The passive protection may include an increase in the overall stability of an earth structure and or an increase in the resistance of the surface affected by the hydraulic action by means of layers of material for protection and or reinforcement. Geosynthetics are particularly suited for passive protection of river and channel banks. Con let's consider also that vegetation provides protection to a bank in two functional ways. First, the protection of the soil surface by reduction of velocity and stresses at the embankment boundary as a result of the coverage provided by stems and leaves that lay down in the flow and blanket the surface. Second, reinforcement of the underlying soil due to the presence of the roots. Geosynthetic reinforced vegetation can resist significantly higher flow velocities compared to unreinforced vegetation. Moreover, the time before failure of course is extended when vegetation is reinforced. You can see uh, on the right picture how the uh, geosynthetic can reinforce the root system of the vegetation. So now let's see the, the main geosynthetic for erosion control. And uh, we start with uh, geomats, uh, which are uh, generally made of synthetic filaments or nets tangled together to form a highly deformable layer, 10, 20 millimeter thick, featured by a very high porosity, uh, usually greater than uh, 90%. Geomats can protect the soil against rain of splash and runoff by keeping in place soil particles. Moreover, geomats can increase by several times the shear resistance of the root system. They can be used for the following application. Erosion protection slopes caused by the impact of rain of and runoff and lining or river channel bank with low water velocities. Here you can see some uh, picture of uh, uh, protection of uh, channel banks uh, using the uh, geomass lined on the, on the surface of the channel. And uh, you see that uh, with the geomass, the, the vegetation can grow dense and the uniform and uh, uh, finally protect the, the banks of the, of the canal. When uh, geomass alone are not enough, there are reinforced geomass which are geocomposite produced by factory joining a geomat and the geogrid of metallic mesh, having the inside strength in the range of 50 to 300 kN per meter. The reinforcement increases the tensile strength of the geomat so that it can be used on long steep slopes along the banks of canals and river courses with relatively high water velocities where high tensile strength is required. Now, here we are talking of uh, water velocity of uh, six, seven meters per second. Another uh, type of geomat is the pre-filled geomat, which are produced by filling the geomat at factory with sand gravel and bitumen, like you see on the right picture, for increasing the weight and the resistance to shear stresses. Other products that you can see in the left picture consist of geomats pre-filled with topsoil and seeds. Next product are geocells, which are uh, honeycomb products manufactured by joining the polymeric strips. Geocell can be used to stabilize a soil thickness of 100 to 300 millimeter when a thick topsoil layer is required for allowing vegetation growth or to ballast geomembranes, as we have seen uh, yesterday in some of the presentations. The top surface may be protected against erosion by placing a geomat or biomat. Biomat and bionets provide temporary erosion control and are either degradable after a given period or they function only long enough to facilitate vegetative growth. Biomats and bionets are made up of natural fibers in the form of a mat of fibers kept together by natural synthetic low weight meshes or in the form of a, of a woven net. They can be used for temporary erosion control on slopes and along the banks of canal and river courses with the low water velocities. Now let's introduce the geocontainers for erosion control. Geosynthetic containers or geocontainers are geocomposite assembled from geotextile and or other geosynthetics 
able to contain soil or other loose material totally closed by stitching, bonding, or other methods for segregating the loose particles by allowing water or other fluid to escape. Geocontainers include geosynthetic tubes, geobags, ballast matrices, and other products. Uh, among the uh, geocontainers, uh, let's see the double twisted wire mesh products, uh, such as gabions and matrices, which are usually implemented in irrigation canals when high water flow velocity occurs and high shear stresses are applied to canal banks. These products are manufactured by assembling in the factory different double twisted wire mesh panels to form boxes of different size that, once they're on the job site, can be filled with rocks of a specified grade. When rocks are not available on the job site or nearby, it is possible also to internally line a mattress with a non-woven geotextile and fill it with sand of vegetative soil and cover it with a geomat to promote rapid vegetation. Other type of geocontainers, uh, the column geocontainers, which uh, can be filled with concrete or sand or even topsoil. Uh, on the uh, left, uh, you see the geobags <coughs> used for the protection of the, of the bank in a curve. And on the right, uh, the uh, um, geocontainer mattress filled with concrete. Finally, uh, among the geosynthetic uh, container, we can uh, mention the geosynthetic cement tissue composite mat, GCCM, which are a class of geosynthetic material with a wide range of geodenic application, you will see in, in one of the next uh, presentations. They are flexible, concrete impregnated uh, fabrics that harden on hydration to form a thin, durable, waterproof and fire resistant concrete layer. Uh, so how to uh, make a choice of the geosynthetic erosion control? Uh, we have to consider that in a channel, the following are usually distinguished. Uh, the bed composed of the bottom and the banks, which is almost permanently underwater. The upper part of the bank submerged for about half the year and subject to periodic variation between the normal water level and the maximum. And the flat plain area between the bed and the main dike, flooded only during a limited period. <clears throat> the bed and banks are the areas of greatest erosive stress, while the higher areas are only periodically exposed to erosive flow and wave motion. Therefore, to avoid erosion, it is necessary to ensure adequate resistance to the speed and shear stresses generated by the water current on the bank. The combination of uh, vegetation and geosynthetic uh, often provide the best and stronger resistance to uh, erosion. So the use of uh, uh, geomats, uh, uh, reinforced geomats and other uh, similar uh, uh, geosynthetic, uh, which uh, enhance the natural resistance of the vegetation. If greater resistance to water stream action is required, geocontainers can provide the necessary stability thanks to the weight of the fill either in the form of uh, bugs or concrete field matrix or uh, gabions or uh, other type of uh, geocontainers that rely on their uh, weight for the uh, protection of the, of the banks. Geocontainers also offer an added benefit as the local material may be used as infill and there may be no need to import additional material. Now, uh, the use of vegetation with or without structural elements, uh, the so-called bioengineering, uh, is increasingly being proposed to replace hard materials while continuing to provide protection from erosion. The protection of banks and dikes with the living plant components can only be carried out permanently at a water depth of about 70, 80 centimeters in clear waters, less so in turbid environment. So typically on the upper part of the banks. An example are geocontainers with already grown vegetation that can withstand even high hydraulic forces with similar or even greater performance than stone riprap. Here you see in the, in the picture, geocontainers with pre-cultivated vegetation in gabions or uh, matrices. 
Finally, an highly effective erosion protection can be obtained with reinforced slopes with a wraparound facing, often integrated with the insertion of willow cuttings. The reinforcing element, geography of textile, steel meshes, with preliminary coating, and so on, can be wrapped around the face to ensure protection from erosion, while the roots of the plants serve as deep anchors in the ground. The vegetation, in turn, provides protection of the geosynthetic from the atmospheric agents. Willows can be introduced into the reinforced soil body during construction. Once grown, the willows will provide high erosion resistance and high CO2 segregation, which is also a very important uh, uh, factor. Finally, uh, consider the, the use of uh, uh, geocontainers for scour protection. But when the turbulent flow, uh, so usually in main uh, water courses, there is always a risk of scouring where water velocities are high, typically around structures such as bridge piers and uh, foundation. Geocontainers filled with sand are an ideal solution to prevent scouring, like in the left picture, or to repair existing scour cavities in river or channel beds. The geocontainers can be filled with local sandy material under dry conditions and placed in the desired position with appropriate equipment. And this uh, ends my overview of the application of uh, geosynthetic for erosion control in river and channel banks. Uh, I wait for uh, eventually uh, uh, question at the end where I can show other uh, uh, slides to, to continue the discussion. Thank you for, uh, for your attention. Thank you, Pietro. Uh, very interesting and uh, enlightening presentation on the scope, the different uh, type of product and application we can have uh, with geosynthetics for er erosion control. So uh, now we have uh, Simon Ebert uh, who will uh, speak to us. Simon uh, has been working in the engineering department as a hydraulic engineer for USCUR Synthetic since April 2017. He is involved in all hydraulic applications, including sludge dewatering. Before joining Husker, Simon worked for the University of Applied Science in Münster, Germany. During this time, he completed his master degree at this university at the Institute for Infrastructure, Water, Resource, and the Environment. So please, Simon. Yeah, thank you, Eric. Thank you for inviting me and thank you for giving me the chance to present my presentation about concrete mattresses for lining and sealing of canals. I hope everyone can see my screen and, and understand me very well. Yes. Great. Thank you. Yeah, uh, coming to my agenda, what do I want to show you today? First of all, I want to show you what concrete mattresses are. I mean, they were briefly introduced by Pietro, by Pietro uh, in the presentation before. Then I want to show you some brief uh, things about the design of concrete mattresses, uh, followed by the benefits of those mattresses. Then I want to show you something about uh, how to install it, so the installation follow-up of those mattresses. Um, I will continue with some very interesting case studies, mainly on uh, sealing with those uh, concrete mattresses in canals. And then I also want to present you one more thing with those uh, mattresses, which is possible. But first of all, let's start with uh, what concrete mattresses are. Um, so in general, it's a very easy thing. Uh, we do have the uh, geotextile formwork, which we can see on the left-hand side. We have a view inside it. Um, in this case, we see one consisting out of the bottom and a top layer connected with vertical binders. And this uh, mattress is afterwards filled with the second uh, uh, component, which is highly fluid concrete. Um, we see a picture of a slump on the right hand side, uh, which uh, shows, yeah, so to say, an ideal slump. And uh, it's recommended to have at least a slump of 63 or more centimeters uh, for concrete to use uh, as filling material for those mattresses. What kind of types of mattresses uh, do we have here? Um, in general, we do have, uh, let's say, mattresses with uh, binders which we see on the, uh, the left-hand side. Um, and we do have also mattresses which, with filter points. 
And those elements are used to control the thickness. So on, on the one hand, the binders, on the other hand, the, the distance and the size of those filter points shown on the mattress types on the right hand side, the white one and the green one. Um, what is the difference uh, there? So the, the one on the left hand side uh, we see here is one which is really, uh, let's say, like a, a continuous mattress, which is impermeable without any filter points. And uh, all the other mattresses which do have filter points, um, these are permeable and can be used for uh, erosion protection. And the impermeable mattress can be used as well for erosion protection as well as for sealing. Um, there's one very interesting uh, thing on those mattresses. Um, this is the shrinkage of those material during filling. Um, if we talk about, let's say, um, mattresses with vertical binders, we do just have an aerial shrinkage of up to 4%. And if we are talking about mattresses with the cross binders or with filter points, um, they shrink up to 30% aerial shrinkage. And this is caused by the, uh, let's say, yeah, pillow effect, so to say. It's like when you have your, your pillow on your bed, which has, for example, 80 times 80, when it's when down, when, there, when there's a sheet, there's no pillow inside. And you put the, the pillow inside, you have in the end, um, let's say, uh, a shrinkage because of the growth of these uh, elements. Um, yeah, how to design those mattresses? Um, we do have, uh, in, in, in according to the type of the application, we also choose uh, what kind of, of type should be done. So either ceiling, erosion protection, or as ballast layer or mechanic, mechanical protection. Uh, on the right hand side, the pictures show uh, a, a pond, a stormwater pond, which has been sealed with an with, uh, with a, a impermeable concrete mattress. And as the water is, let's say, stored behind the wear, which is, let's say, located behind the inflow, uh, we see that it's fully impermeable, this tank. And on the other picture on the bottom right hand side of the slide, we see a compound slope consisting of uh, mattresses with filter points. One which is vegetated, which is on the bottom part of the bank, and the other one is not being uh, vegetated as it is usually um, underwater. There are also uh, different approaches to design those mattresses available in the literature, by, for example, by Pilacic, Hawksworth, or, or others. And um, there are also special tests like uh, permeability tests for those mattresses, ice load strength test, tensile strength test, um, resistance against overflow uh, or overtopping, and stuff like this. So there are a lot of different special tests available as well. Um, Benefits of those mattresses are uh, that it is a very flexible system which adapts to the underground. Um, it's a proven ceiling system for canals, ditches, ponds, etc. PP. I will show afterwards in the case study some very interesting uh, examples of, of those ceilings. Um, it's, it does have a very high hydraulic resistance. Um, in the picture on the right hand side, we see an inlet of a former a soft coal pit in the eastern part of Germany. And um, there's a small river redirected uh, into this brown coal pit in order to flood it via this inlet um, lined with, with a concrete mattress. And the discharge where it's designed for is uh, uh, up to five cubic meters per second. Um, we have a low Munnings N of just 0.015, a high mechanical resistance. And as you can see on the picture on the right-hand side, it's possible to install it on steep slopes as well. And one other very, very, very high benefit is that we have the possibility to install it underwater with a quite high installation, installation speed of up to 2,000 squares per day. And last but not least, uh, we are talking about a coherent system, which means that uh, when we see the pitch stone red man on the left hand side, uh, we have this so called ball and socket joints when we have, let's say, those mattresses installed. Uh, that this failure we see on the left hand side cannot happen. Yeah, how are those mattresses being installed? Um, or how can they get installed? We see uh, on the left hand side, uh, on, the, on the top side, how it should be done. So on the first step, the, uh, the, the surface uh, has to be prepared and should be leveled as, as shown there. So for example, with, uh, with an excavator or long long arm excavator. Then the empty panels um, can be laid out, fixed on the top of the slope, as uh, can be seen with the steel pins there. 
And um, in the inlets, in the mattresses, which can be assembled in advance already, uh, the hoses, uh, which can be connected with the concrete pump afterwards, can be uh, in, in can be pushed in in advance already, so that you do just have to connect the um, the pump, uh, and then you can fill it with concrete and you see the filled mattress with uh, with highly fluid concrete on the right hand side. What is also be possible is uh, shown on the bottom of those of this slide is that you can install it on very rough surfaces as, as well. So this shows or demonstrates that those mattresses are really highly resistant and uh, that it's not necessary to have such a nice level subsoil, but it's recommended. Yeah, after the intro introduction, I want to show you um, some case studies. Um, as already said in the beginning, um, I will just show case studies where we talk about um, sealing of canals, but we do also have the possibility to use it as erosion protection. Um, there are several projects uh, all over the world, um, let's say on every continent, uh, including India, that where we have those mattresses installed. And um, in order to demonstrate, um, let's say the lifetime of those mattresses, I, I put in a, a project uh, from Spain installed in 1973 where uh, the Canal Imperial de Aragon uh, has been sealed with a concrete mattress. And we see on the picture on the left-hand side, uh, the condition in 2000, in the year 2000, so <clears throat> 37 years later. And in 2011, another 11, uh, 11 years later, that the, uh, that the canal is still in a very good um, uh, status and that it's still totally functioning. Another case study um, from 1970, uh, where we are talking about uh, erosion protection of a lake bank. Um, uh, we see here um, on the picture on the left hand side and on the right hand side, we see the condition in, uh, in, in the year 2008 and there's no cracks or no settlements. Uh, so no failures on the concrete mattresses can be seen even after such a long uh, service life of the, uh, of the concrete mattress. Um, coming to, to another case study in, in France, uh, being installed in the year 1994, um, it's the Canal de Chonage. Um, there has been installed on the right hand side on the bank, uh, impermeable uh, concrete mattresses, a mattress and on the bottom a stone protection, so to say, a flexible one. And uh, this flexible one is uh, in case the, uh, um, there's any scouring happening on the toe of this revetment, that's a flexible one then can close uh, the scour. So this is the basic idea about uh, the arrangement of these two different types of, um, of mattresses. And what I want to show with uh, this uh, case study in general is that it is possible to combine different types of mattresses in order to, uh, yeah, to, to have the benefit of each and every type combined in, in, in one singular project. Um, see some pictures here uh, during the installation on the left-hand side. Um, so again, you see the empty mattress being placed on the, on the bank, um, fixed with steel pins on top, and also some, uh, yeah, some hoses being uh, pushed in the mattress in this white socks, which are the inlets. And on the right-hand side, we see this um, after completion. And here we see the condition on the left-hand side four years later in the year 1998. And on the right-hand side, we see the condition in 2016 and what we, we can still see no failure, no cracks. So it's still in a very good uh, uh, status, this uh, ceiling element. Um, another case study uh, which has been executed in Italy is a, a, a canal which uh, is the consumption canal of a hydroelectric power plant close to Moroval in Italy. On the left hand side we see the design and um, you see here it's uh, not a too big canal but the, uh, it's, it has been excavated as can be seen on the right hand side and there, is, uh, there are very steep slopes. So it's uh, approximately 1.6 over one. So it's, uh, let's say, steeper than one over one. And it's just uh, the excavated soil where the empty concrete mattress has been laid out, as can be seen on the left-hand side. 
um, um, stitched together on site and then afterwards it has been filled uh, with highly fluid concrete via this concrete pump with the white one which can be seen there in the middle of, of the picture on the right hand side of this slide. Um, after completion it looked like this, uh, how it can be seen on the left hand side, so a really nice shaped, uh, very like regular prof profile. And thanks to Google Street View, um, I uh, can could manage to find a picture there, how it looked like uh, in summer this year, so in July 2021, at least in this section, it still looks very well and it's uh, yeah, still watertight and still doing his job fulfilling his job very well there. Um, another very big project um, is a case study uh, of the rehabilitation of the Mittlere Isar Canal in Germany, which has been um, done in 2013. And um, as we can see on the map of the left-hand side, it's close to Munich um, and it's the bypass of the river Isar. We are, so we have the ESA on the left hand side, then the airport in the middle and the Mittlere ESA canal on the, on the right hand side. And the picture on the right hand side shows an aerial view of the emptied canal of a previous rehabilitated section. And um, the reason why uh, concrete mattresses has been chosen to, um, yeah, to re rehabilitate or to reseal this canal. Is, um, this is, um, let's say, a canal which, uh, yeah, brings water to a to a power plant. So it's a cooling water canal in the end of the day, and uh, of course the power plant can only produce a current or electricity when it's, uh, yeah, when there is water flowing through, and um, therefore it had to it had to always. Uh, let's say, uh, yeah, there always needs to be water inside. And therefore, the, the concrete mattresses has been chosen because it can be filled underwater. We see the cross section of the canal here. So on both banks, there's an old, let's say, concrete uh, revetment uh, being in place, which is no longer watertight. And the installation mode, which has been chosen uh, in this project, was um, installation from a pontoon. We see it here and on the next slide in the schematic view. Um, so the pontoon, um, let's say, drove on the banks of the uh, of the canal and via a ramp, um, the bottom part of the mattresses uh, was, let's say, lowered down on the canal bed and the, um, the sides which were, let's say, afterwards pulled on top of the slopes were, were fixed to the bottom. So during filling, um, the, the, the material was lowered via this ramp. And after the canal bed part was filled um, on top uh, via, so via the pontoon or via a concrete pump, um, the material was pulled up to the top of the banks and then has also been filled. We will see it now uh, with some pictures. I think it's better understandable then. On the left-hand side, we see the pontoon with the tent on top where the installation works has been uh, let's say, or from, from where the exp excavation works has been executed. On the right-hand side, we can see a close-up of the ramp. And um, here in this picture on the left-hand side, we see uh, after the empty material uh, was pulled up on top of the banks, how the slope elements or the banks were filled um, with concrete uh, where the people are sitting in the backhoe of this excavator on the left-hand side. And on the right hand side, we see the rehabilitated section, how it looks like. Um, the last um, case study I wanted to show you is um, the sealing of, uh, of a drainage ditch for wastewater treatment plant in, uh, in Berlin. Uh, the left hand side, we see the cross section here. So it's uh, a, a, a small, let's say ditch, a small canal, which has to be widened um, and therefore needs another seal. A ceiling layer and on the right hand side we see the subsoil preparation um, and uh, here uh, it continues the, the, the so it continued to profile the, uh, the the subsoil so the banks and uh, of the closer picture on the bottom left hand side of the picture on the left hand side we see the the final bedding layer which was uh, a coarse gravel 
which were used uh, in order to place the material, so the empty concrete mattress on top. Again, it has been fixed with, uh, with piles on top of the crest and then filled with concrete. And after filling, it looked like this, uh, how we can see it here. So it, it really nicely, it's a nicely shaped, very regular uh, flow profile, which we can see here. And um, I want to close my presentation after showing you all those uh, case studies with the promised one more thing I wanted to show you. This is another application of uh, concrete mattresses, which can be also used as pipe covers. And why do I show it here in, your, in, the, in the presentation where we are talking about canals? Uh, the reason is uh, that also pipes cross those canals and uh, yeah, in order to avoid uplift of those pipes, um, um, they need the ballast layer and this ballast layer can be also made out of those concrete mattresses as can be seen here. I thank you for your attention and uh, I'm looking forward to answer your questions after the presentation. Thank you, Simon. So uh, again, you have the Q&A uh, button at the bottom of the screen. We already have a couple questions uh, to be answered, so that's good. Uh, voila, so thank you, Simon. So next speaker is Will Crawford. So Will is a director and co-founder of Concrete Canvas Limited, which together with Peter Bruin, he has led from a university startup to a multinational manufacturing business selling into over 80 countries around the world. Will originally studied engineering at the University of Bristol in the UK and Berkeley in the US, and also has a degree from the RCA and Imperial College in London. So Will, please. Thank you very much. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Fantastic. And my screen's being shared. So thank you very much, Eric, for the kind introduction. Um, welcome to this presentation um, entitled An Introduction to Geosynthetic Cementitious Composite Mats, an Innovative Approach to Lining Canals. Um, yeah, as Eric said, my name is Will Crawford. I'm director and co-founder of Concrete Canvas. And I'd like to start this presentation just by reiterating the importance of water scarcity and seepage losses. This is a, a real and pressing issue which is facing the world at the moment. Um, it's estimated that around 50% of the world's population will face water shortages by 2025 if we do nothing. That's according to the UK government um, Trade Commissioner for Africa. And we've heard over the last two days, how water seepage losses in canals um, are a real problem. Uh, one third of water is lost due to, during transportation in canals based on a 2006 census by ICID. And I think Professor Giroux made this point very well on Monday when he pointed out that irrigation accounts for 90% of fresh water that's used, used by mankind. And it's therefore or also offers the most potential when we're looking to tackle water scarcity. So I'd like to just very briefly um, summarize some of the challenges faced with conventional concrete lining solutions. Um, and these are well documented in the two, 2017 paper by Giroux and Pouskelet. And you know, the point about this is that concrete as a material can have real benefits. Um, it can be extremely hard wearing and durable but if it's incorrectly designed or installed, it is also prone to failure. Um, the images here show some good examples where ground heave has led to concrete cracking. This cracking has led to water seepage losses, and this in turn has led to a multitude of problems. It can lead to salination of the soils, water logging, and ultimately through dissolution of the soils, co complete collapse of the structure itself. In addition, concrete can also be quite um, challenging from an installation point, point of view. And when I'm talking about concrete, I'm talking about conventional poured concrete or precast concrete slabs. Um, it can be time consuming, especially when compared to geosynthetic solutions. And this is a challenge, especially when you have short maintenance windows, as you often do in irrigation infrastructure. On-site quality control can be a challenge, especially in remote locations or, or in developing parts of the world. 
And then poor quality concrete mixes can exacerbate the issues mentioned above. And then finally, pouring concrete um, can have limitations in terms of the side slope angles achieved. And a lot of these issues we heard about on day one, but why is concrete still used? Um, it's still the prevalent material for lining canals. And as Giroux pointed out, and Pouskelet in their 2017 paper, they remain the preferred solution because it's a material that engineers are familiar with. And, and it does have its benefits, as I mentioned, it's very hard wearing, it's extremely durable and it's UV resistant. And this means it can be easily maintained. It's not prone to local theft or vandalism and can withstand hoof traffic from visitors such as my friend here um, that often like to frequent water canals in agricultural areas. So the, the challenge, how do we combine the benefits of concrete with the benefits of geosynthetic products? And this was the question that the US um, Bureau of Reclamation sought to answer in 2002, um, when they conducted what, what is probably the most far reaching and wide ranging study into canal lining materials that took into account fluid applied membranes, um, poured concrete, geosynthetic solutions, sprayed concrete. And they did this over 10 years across 11 irrigation districts on 34 different canal sections. And that report is still ongoing. The most recent um, version covered up to 25 years of use. And the result of this study, again, just reiterating where, what Giroux, the point Giroux was making on day one, is that the solution which offers the best cost benefit um, is a geomembrane covered with a protective layer of concrete. So ideally we need a lining material which can solve these dual challenges, providing the function of waterproofing plus the function of protection and erosion control. In other words, a material which is simultaneously both impermeable, durable, and hard wearing. Thankfully, geosynthetics can now provide a solution in the form of a new class of material called GCCMs or geosynthetic cementitious composite mats. These are supplied on a roll as a flexible fabric like geosynthetic uh, products. They're laid directly onto the ground and jointed and fixed using many of the same techniques as conventional geosynthetics. But once in place, they're sprayed with water and this then activates the cementitious component within the material, which then hardens over 24 hours to form a fiber reinforced concrete layer fused onto the surface of a geomembrane liner. The most widespread GCCMs have been in use since 2009 uh, and have been uh, used all over the world for a wide range of um, applications in a, in a range of industries. Over four and a half million square meters of GCCMs have now been installed. And there's a growing number of international standards which now define minimum performance requirements for different applications. You can see on the screen a typical section. Um, the construction of a GCCM is made up of a fibrous polyester top surface, overlaying a fiber matrix, which is embedded with a high early strength dry concrete mix. And that's all on top of a polymeric liner on the rear surface. And whilst these products have traditionally been used for erosion control applications, around six years ago, a variant was developed specifically for containment applications where testable impermeable jointing is required. And these materials are known as GCCBs or geosynthetic cementitious composite barriers. And these incorporate a typically one millimeter thick geomembrane liner with a welding flap. And these GCCBs can be used in larger canals where reducing water seepage is critical 
for example, in primary or secondary canal structures. So how are they supplied? Well, typically in bulk rolls, um, uh, typical width one meter and up to 200 square meters can be transported on a single pallet or in batched rolls, which can be man portable or in roll widths up to 2.2 to 3.3 meters wide. And as I mentioned, there's now a growing number of GCCM specific international standards. Arguably the most important of these is the um, product specification standard uh, D8364, which defines minimum performance level for these different GCCM types. So a type one is typically five millimeters thick um, and used for applications where there's no surface water, um, such as slope protection or bund lining. Type two GCCMs are typically eight millimeters thick and these are used for lining channels where low to medium flow rates are required. And type three application, uh, type, type three GCCMs are the highest performance, typically 13 millimeters thick and used for high water flow or high load applications. Um, but it's not the thickness which is important in determining the class, it's the minimum performance level. And I'd like to just run through a, key, a few of those key properties um, and, and why they're relevant. There's a lot more in the ASTM, um, such as abrasion resistant puncture and tensile strength, but the key ones are flexural strength. This is the best overall indication of GCCM performance. And since it can be measured within 24 hours of hydration, it also provides the best index test for quality control. The second key property is compression, compressive strength. Um, this is a concrete test, and this should be done in accordance with uh, to ASTM D8329, uh, because it's a cube test based on the cementitious powder fill. It needs to be done at a water to powder ratio that's the same as that that's achieved in the GCCM material itself. So that's extremely important to make sure the results are, um, are reflective of the material performance. And this is a great test because the compressive strength of the powder fill, um, when it's cured and tested properly, gives a very good indication of the long-term performance of GCCMs and GCCBs. And then finally, outside of the ASTM specification, there are other internationally recognized certifications which can be used to determine long-term performance of GCCMs and Bs, such as the BBA system. The final property I want to talk through um, in more detail is um, the way that GCCMs can accommodate high levels of ground deformation whilst continuing to provide impermeability and effective erosion control. And, and this is due to the composite nature of the product where the fiber reinforcement initiates micro cracking within the concrete and this allows relatively high strains to be achieved with minimal visible cracking within the concrete itself. Um, this is demonstrated by the stress displacement graph. Um, you can see there is, there's three phases to rupture. There's an initial crack followed by an incremental sawtooth rupture before final failure. And effectively, this means GCCMs can deform by up to 5% without compromising the impermeability of the membrane or the protection provided by the concrete. And this has obvious benefits when we look at the issues faced by conventional concrete canal lining um, solutions as highlighted previously. So I'd now like to move on and talk about some real world applications of GCCMs and Bs by looking at a couple of projects in Chile and in Egypt. So this first project is in the La Serena region of Chile, completed in 2018. The project was to line a 2.4 kilometre um, irrigation canal, um, which was suffering um, from severe water seepage losses. Um, and in order to achieve a uniform profile, uh, a trapezoidal former here was used 
and then fill material compacted behind the former to allow the canal fall and profile to be precisely controlled. This prepared ground was then overlaid with the GCCM, laid transversely across the channel, and the edges fixed into the anchor trenches using ground pegs. Um, each layer was overlapped by 100 millimetres in the direction of water flow, shingled, and then jointed using screws and sealant. And one of the really interesting things about this project, key challenge on this site, was that they could only cut off the water supply for eight days at a time without risking the local community's crop harvest. So three te teams were actually constantly in operation uh, during an eight day installation window. One team grading the soil, second team laying the GCCM and a third team working behind them to hydrate the GCCM and so on. And using this method, a total of 18,000 square meters was installed without the canal needing to be shut down for any more than eight days at a time. And there's been, um, based on the success of this project, there's been multiple uh, follow-on installations for, for GCCMs in other similar projects in Chile. So the next case study is a bit closer to home in Egypt. Um, this is where a GCCB, so this is the barrier variant with an integral thermally weldable geomembrane liner on the rear surface, was used to line a channel in Atfir, Egypt. And this was done as a demonstration project for the um, Ministry of Irrigation last year. So I've got a short video. Um, Prior to lining of this channel, around 75% of the water transported through uh, these canals was deemed to be lost through filtration. Uh, and in addition, the sides of the canals had uh, uh, collapsed due to heavy erosion. Um, for this trial, the channel profile had been prepared with a blinding layer of sand um, to reinstate the intended profile. The GCCB was supplied in two meter wide rolls in lengths of 20 meters. And these were used to line an eight meter wide profile over a length of 50 meters for the trial. Rolls were cut to length on site and pegged in position prior to jointing. And this was done through a combination of thermal welding and adhesive sealants for trial purposes. You can see hydration there, which was carried out um, three times due to the high temperatures. Uh, with a final hydration at the end of the day. Um, the entire section was lined by 10 people in less than a day, having never used these materials before uh, and was deemed a success by the Ministry of Irrigation. So I just want to summarize the benefits of GCCMs and Bs. They're a new class of geosynthetic that can be used for erosion control and seepage control. They offer a number of benefits. First of all, speed compared to conventional concrete. They're typically 10 times faster to install. Secondly, ease, 200 square meters of concrete and geomembrane can be transported on a single pallet. They're very durable. The geomembrane is protected from the point of manufacture and can withstand maintenance and cattle damage and Obviously, concrete as a product has a very high carbon footprint. Compared to conventional concrete, these are very thin composite materials which have a fraction of the carbon footprint. And I'd just like to reiterate that despite this being a relatively new technology, um, we've now seen over four and a half million square meters installed globally into erosion control and containment applications. So, that concludes my presentation. I'd like to thank our sales partners in Chile and Egypt to help provide the images um, for the videos and case studies. Um, my contact details are on the slide and I'll now stop sharing my screen and hand back to Eric. Thank you, Will. Uh, very, very interesting presentation. Uh... I think that's what one of the good one of the good innovations uh, that took place in the geosynthetic industry in the in the recent decade. <laughs> it's uh, so congratulations for this uh, for this innovation. 
So uh, now we will continue with uh, other product uh, innovative or well established. Uh, next speaker is Paolo Di Pietro. He is currently Senior Technical Education and Know-how Manager at Officin McAfee Corporate Headquarters in Bologna, Italy. With a degree in civil hydraulic, uh, in civil hydraulic engineering earned in Italy in, in 1984, and over 30 years of, as a professional in design and construction of geotechnical and hydraulic engineering works, Paolo's experience started as a project design engineer at the lead, at the lead of a technical engineering team, supervising and coordinating studies from feasibility to final design, performing cost analysis and overseeing construction sites. Having served for four years in the USA as a technical director for the North American operation and later for another four-year term as a technical head of the German operation group headquartered in Berlin, his responsibilities included research, development, and innovation of new steel wire and geosynetic systems as well. Since 2001, Paolo holds frequent seminars and workshops to design engineers, contractors, and state officials in geotechnical soil retaining structure slope stabilization, river and erosion control works, and best, contribute and best management practice of soil bioengineering systems. He is also an active contributor to the development of international standards like ASTM, EN, DIN, and author of several papers as, at international conference. So, Paolo, please. We see you. Thank you, Eric. I and we know, hear you. Do you hear me? Yes. Oh, very good. Okay. Well, <clears throat> first of all, thank you um, and hello to everyone. Uh, I'm pleased to share this. Uh, um, <clears throat> excuse me, let me close this. Okay. To share this brief outline on the use of gabions and mattresses for the stabilization on, and seepage prevention in water courses. And um, I will actually. Uh, speak about um, other challenges that we are all faced uh, today in, um, in the current times. So in order to do this, I need to briefly spend a few words on uh, river works to start with, as uh, they are fundamental to understand why and when solutions for erosion control are necessary. Um, and what are the most suitable remedial works? I'd like then to mention only a brief mention, obviously, um, due to the limited time, to the extensive research studies behind the choice of these solutions and their design methods. And finally, mention to four key features to be taken into account when uh, facing the challenges in, of the design of erosion control structures in uh, river environments. So the first point we shall not forget is that uh, when we're dealing with hydraulics, uh, we're not dealing with a precise science. When we design, we base our choices on the theories, on the experience, on know-how, and on best management practices, assuming that the nature's effects, uh, like rainfall, flooding, storms, etc., are coming from statistical data. Therefore, um, it is a fundamental task for the engineer to perform a risk assessment, analyzing what if scenarios beyond the assumed data. Here we can see the opposite side of what we said. Desertification is an issue. Another challenge we face today is the effect of a flood. Uh, these images are the images that we see on TV every day. Um, they show the ever-increasing effects of floods and, uh, oops, sorry, I was too fast. <laughs> uh, the ever-increasing effects of the floods uh, uh, on infrastructures and on the impact on human lives. Consequences of flooding, most of which catastrophic, impose engineers to consider how the human presence can interfere with the dynamics of a water course. A road in an alpine region or even an entire section of a highly urbanized area can be subject to heavy damage and cost for the reconstruction quite high with an impact on the surrounding environment. Understanding the rules means to understand how instability due to the erosion generates. 
and we start uh, from the problem then see what's the cause um, where and where it's generated and finally the resulting effect we could have drainage resulting in surface runoff occurring in natural or natural or artificial slopes and uh, finally generating um, let's say erosion due to lack of vegetation or soil instability another problem is seepage resulting into a reduced soil uh, shear strength where in the embankments and slopes frequently turning into a global instability. Another problem we face is the scour, the formation of scour holes at the toe of a river bank, critical for bridge abutments or generating progressive instability. And finally, the wet and dry cycles of temperature variations resulting in the formation of cracks in cohesive slopes or resulting in progressive debris. Erosion protection systems shall be designed considering the flood duration and that which will depend on the type of water course. For small rivers or drainage channels, we shall consider the few hours for the duration of the peak flood. When we speak of the medium sized rivers, say 10, 30 meters wide in the average, flood durations may be in the range of 10 to 24 hours typically. In large for larger river, we can easily reach flood durations above the 24 hours still a few days. And then, not to forget, our ever-increasing needs of, urban, of our urbanization, which lead to, to changes into the hydraulic regimes over time. What we see here from the hydrograph is the same amount of rainfall precipitation may generate a much higher discharge into the river section. Erosion protection and bank stabilization systems can be grouped uh, in, main, uh, in two main application areas. Um, uh, let's say the first part is the linings where like blankets, turf reinforcement mattings, meaning rolled erosion control products or heavy duty systems like the Reno mattress. The term heavy duty is conventionally used to specify that the weight is an important component of the stability. And here we can you know, classify a number of uh, the products that also we have seen earlier. In the second category up above, we speak of structures which need to, to address two functions, uh, the geotechnical and the hydraulic stability. Here we can find gabions conventionally or say reinforced soil system uh, for the stabilization of, uh, of the slope. Each erosion system meets different requirements and, then, and should be used when the project conditions are suitable. For drainage channels, like channelized streams, we collect and convey the water to a safe zone. So it is very true to say that um, in some applications uh, to prevent seepage, an impermeable membrane can also be used uh, to um, is isolate the flow through or the embank. They mostly have permanent water. The duration of the flood events with the peak discharges normally are in the range of hours, as we said. Protection measures in these courses guarantee that the flow is safely brought to the delivery network. So this is a typical case of a drainage channel with sloped banks. When the drainage channels run through an urban area, the lack of space requires the sections to have a vertical or almost vertical slope. And here we can see some examples of typical structures in urban settings. In the hydraulics of open channels, an important development has been the creation of standards for erosion control. In the US, the most referenced standard defining performance limits for erosion protection systems in open channels is ASTM D6460, virtually applicable to all types of erosion protection systems. This standard defines the stability for aligning when either a collapse or an excessive erosion occurs. In 2018 through 2019, so in a couple of years, rockfield mattresses and geomats were subjected to an extensive research study at Colorado State University. 
to define their technical boundaries for use in design. The research was aimed at testing performance for both under the same hydraulic conditions. The geomat was reinforced with a steel mesh and it was tested both in unvegetated and vegetated conditions. You can see a picture here uh, in a nursery plant where we vegetated the geosynthetic mat. The research was quite interesting because it allowed to define a new and high performing type of mattress later called Reno Mattress Plus according to a more realistic performance based criteria. The experimental results showed an increase in the limit values compared to those obtained in the previous research in 1984. The difference may be attributed to the new mattress configuration and to a different interpretation of the threshold values. Along with the new interpretation model, this difference in performance can be attributed to the use of a more suitable rock fill, both in size and in uniformity, the thickness of the mattress, meaning how many layers of rock, the use of a double pleated diaphragm, and the use of vertical connections. So we can therefore express the allowable stress as a numerical function proportional to these variables. As mentioned in previously, the scope of the research was not just on the rock mattresses, but also to establish a boundary line between heavy duty mattress and the light system like the Magmat R Geomat, which is Geomat with reinforced with the steel mesh in consideration of the ability of the last one to develop a cortical vegetative layer, which will enhance the natural recovery and resist to the effects of high flow regimes. One of the questions was to evaluate the advantages of combining the steel mesh to a three-dimensional geomat compared to the conventional 100% geosynthetic mats. The two graphs that you, we see here show um, the key tested features of the geocomposite Magmat R on the right-hand side, contributing to the vegetation growth compared to the average other of other geomats left on the, on the left side. The test results were able to show the overall good performance of the new geocomposite. In other words, for the geomat reinforced with steel mesh, results from research in fact allowed to obtain a correlation between performance versus time, particularly important to assess the vegetation beneficial effect. The relatively open matrix of the geomat showed a particularly fast vegetation time. You can see here on the clock side that um, just after the first six weeks exposed in a nursery plant, full vegetation was already achieved. So even if the geomat in the initial stage started low in performance, just after a few weeks, it could show a dense vegetation condition much sooner than others with a closed matrix. So this 3D graph is quite interesting because it, it shows um, that the anticipated rapid change in performance characteristic of the geocomposite over time compared to the others. This graph shows <clears throat> both performances of vegetated mats with steel mesh, the Magmat R, and the high performing rock field mattresses of this Reno Mattress Plus. For the last one, the increased performance here in vegetated conditions is based on literature. Since the vegetation growth will depend on climate and it will have effects on product performance, the design curves for Magmat R have been defined within a range. The upper curve, this one here, represents the stability limit values assuming fully vegetated geomat, while the lower curve represents the minimum value assuming that full vegetation growth will take longer due to the uncertainty, uncertainty of the site conditions, so climate, sun exposure, humidity. The graph shows also the combined solution where mattresses and geomats can combine together. The mattresses 
shall be topsoiled during installation before the geomat lid. This way, the curves for the geocomposite mattress may be combined in the first hours of duration until the intersection with the vegetated mattress, the curve will be the one of the vegetated geomat. So for longer durations, namely after the intersection with the vegetated mattress, the combined system will follow the mattress curve. As a last point, uh, I'd like to mention the four key features of success for erosion protection systems to provide stability in water courses. And they are the flexibility, the filtration and permeability, durability, and finally, environmental compatibility. When we speak about flexibility, flexible structures allow the structure to keep contact with the soil underneath. So they maintain the protective function over time. Rigid structures, although resistance to for, resi very resistant to forces, are not suitable to conform to soil contours. The second point is filtration. This is also very important in river environments, as they allow the natural exchange of water from and to the soil behind and below the structure. We speak also of durability because in a river environment, we shall guarantee the long durability considering effects of the flowing water on the wire. International regulations are becoming restrictive and do not allow, for instance, the metallic coatings without an additional polymer protection necessary to provide the long life. And finally, the environment where the old gabions and mattresses were installed, we see today just the river with its stable banks, vegetation, shaded spots, fresh water, local fauna. The ecosystem has reestablished. Particularly interesting is the example of a tree grown through the rocks and the steel wire mesh, engulfing the steel and rocks as a part of the trunk. Rather difficult to figure how this could happen. Well, however, quite logical considering that the tree grew through the ears from a little stem to a tree, year after year, finding its way out from the ground under the gabion to the surface, each ear expanding and engulfing the steel and the rocks as a part of it. Nature did its course. Erosion protection systems from light linings to enrolled form to like geomats to gabions and mattresses can also be combined with soil bioengineering techniques using fascines, willows, brush mattresses, etc., to create a favorable environment for the nature to regenerate. In summary, for the stability of a water course, we shall consider two types of requirements. The hydraulic requirements, meaning the base of technical engineering knowledge, including an evaluation of the geotechnical and hydraulic stability, correct and sound engineering practices, design methods based on a risk assessment, so the what-if scenarios that I mentioned earlier, an integrated river management approach, meaning to consider how erosion will affect the surrounding environment. But this is only a, a first part because uh, we shall not forget the environmental requirements, meaning treat the river as a living environment. This means that the river is a dynamic environment. Consider it may change its course over time. It means applying river engineering principles and minimize the changes in morphology and nature of the water course. It also means protect, use protection measures with a proven ability to recover, re-establishing natural conditions. This is using sustainable systems. And finally, provide solutions aimed at balancing the ecosystems. And I'd like to conclude with a quick overview of past channel and bank protection projects typical of dry zones, where the flood events typically occur rarely as uh, the previous speaker mentioned it quite importantly, but with high intensity though. So here, erosion control structures serve the dual purpose of collecting 
and safely delivering them to a location for a healthy use to the communities. Last information for those of you interested, you may still register for a live webinar, which I will hold tomorrow, November 18, on specific subjects for the anti-intrusion solutions for dikes and levees. I thank you very much for your attention, and of course, I'm available for any questions. Thank you, Paolo. Very interesting presentation. So uh, now we're going to continue with, uh, well, first, uh, don't forget to ask questions in the Q&A uh, section uh, of Zoom. If you need to ask direct questions to some author for specific answer to individuals that you need immediate answer, you can also use the chat. Uh, so I, I, a few questions were probably not question for discussion. They were more specific to authors, so I deleted them, so just so you know. So. Uh, uh, so, uh, since uh, 2010, Ziv works for PRS Geotech, Geotech Technologies as a territory director responsible for the business in Africa and Asia continents. Ziv gained more than 15 years of experience and know-how focusing on geosynetics material for the civil infrastructure industry. During his time, he got specialist in cellular confinement systems based on HDPE and new polymeric alloy materials. Ziv, Ziv has a uh, vast experience in international marketing operation via direct sales and local channel promotion, promoting geosynthetic solutions for the civil infrastructure market. Prior to PRS, Ziv worked in various high-tech companies for more than 20 years, leading product development, business development responsibility, as well as marketing campaigns for advanced technology products in various industrial arenas. Ziv was a speaker in various, in various conferences in Asia and Africa. He holds a Bachelor of Science Engineering degree since 1985. So Ziv, please. Okay. Uh, you can share your screen. And we hear you. Okay. Can you hear me, Harry? Yes. Yes. Great. Great. Everything is good. Okay, so uh, first I would like to uh, thank to my colleague, Eyal Balkman, which assists me in preparing this presentation. Uh, the presentation, the title will be about uh, protection of uh, canals utilizing uh, geocell, especially uh, the NPA, which is a novel polymeric alloy uh, geocell rather than the conventional geocell, and I will speak about that uh, more detailly uh, during the presentation. Uh, the presentation will include several topics. Uh, first, uh, we shall go through the evolution of uh, the solutions associated with uh, erosion control and canal uh, protection. And uh, later on, we shall focus on the geocell mechanism. Uh, and uh, how does it contribute to uh, specific applications like uh, canal protection? Uh, later on, we shall uh, discuss uh, developments uh, in the regulation associated with design guidelines for uh, implementation of uh, geocells uh, for various applications, and uh, definitely how this associates also with the uh, canal. Uh, protection. Uh, we shall devote uh, some uh, uh, slides about uh, what is uh, unique and what are the properties of the NPA versus uh, other type of uh, geocells or conventional geocells. And uh, we shall conclude with uh, the benefits of uh, implementing a geocell for such applications like canal protection. This, uh, this slide uh, describes the evolution of a uh, type of uh, solutions uh, in canals over the recent years. Uh, definitely, it started with uh, uh, stones or bricks, which uh, protect uh, various uh, uh, canals. Later on, uh, it was utilizing mainly concrete. And then we see a combination of uh, 
German brand, mainly German brand with uh, concrete. And uh, this is something that we discussed uh, through the various, uh, through the last uh, two days, uh, uh, which is mainly, this is the most cost effective uh, solution versus uh, other technologies. And, uh, uh, and currently what we are dealing with is the is implementing the GeoCell as a main principal uh, um, a solution for canal protection. Before we are trying to describe the solution, we should try summarize the, uh, the challenges that we try to address in a typical uh, application. Uh, we would like to avoid erosion, definitely. This is the slope protection. Uh, we would like also to avoid the uh, barriers to the flow and uh, let it uh, stream uh, freely as possible. We would like to decrease the seepage, uh, as we discussed uh, also uh, recently. Um, some of the cases we have a weak soil, so we would like to increase bearing capacity of this uh, substance uh, under the canal. Uh, it's not a uh, utilizing one type of uh, a scenario. It uh, passes various uh, sections and it might face also weak soil. And uh, then we need to take care on the, the building capacity of it. We would like to provide economical uh, solution, which will provide improvement uh, of all these challenges in economical manner. And definitely, we look for a solution which should be durable, uh, as uh, was discussed uh, yesterday and the day before. Uh, we are talking about a solution which would uh, um, would stay uh, sustain uh, for a long term. Uh, people talk about more than one hundred years. Uh, currently, we can uh, say that. Uh, the durability of uh, the current solutions is about uh, 40 years, 40 to 50 years. And definitely, this is also a challenge to any uh, a new uh, solutions that we might think about. Uh, this uh, is, uh, in a nutshell, represent current uh, solution, which is based on uh, concrete, uh, uh, reinforced concrete usually, so it is reinforced with steel bar. It includes also expansion joints, which uh, create uh, quite a uh, mess labor and uh, a, a bit complicated uh, um, solution for the project. And it might include uh, or not a, a liner under beneath in order to uh, isolate and keep in total uh, solution if it is required. Not always it is required. And sometimes uh, uh, we see many times in which uh, uh, people ignore the, the, the German brand. A typical cross section of uh, uh, alternative solution, uh, which uh, utilizing a geocell is uh, is uh, associated with several uh, uh, applications. Uh, mainly, what we can see here is that uh, we have we have uh, the liner. The liner is the red line, and then on the top of that uh, we have uh, concrete. But this concrete is filled into the gel set. So in this case, what uh, we can see is that the gel cell perform in this application as a, a liner a coverage uh, to, or, or, or liner uh, protection or, geo, or, or uh, uh, it's a liner, it's a AGP liner uh, um, protection. Um, it also, it protects also the bed and it might protect also the slope uh, by creating a stiff uh, layer. Now, we can see also another application which might be applicable, which is not uh, shown here, but it can be 
stiff, the stiffen the, the, the uh, soil under beneath the uh, germ membrane or in a, the liner, and by that increasing the bearing capacity of this uh, soil and uh, protect uh, also any elongation or, or of the or, or any movement of the soil which might hurt the geo membrane. What uh, we can see here that uh, the we, the gel cell provide uh, tensor strengths and uh, stiffening of the of the concrete rather by uh, steel bar. It replaces the steel bar and provide uh, 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 stiffness and reinforcement to the concrete by uh, the gel cell itself. This is a picture of uh, implement. Implement, implementation of uh, a project that uh, we have done uh, in uh, South America, where you see that uh, uh, we don't use here a liner, we uh, uh, compact the, the soil and, uh, and on the top of it uh, can uh, line the, can line the, lay the, the, the geo cell and infill it with any material which has been designed. It can be gravel, it can be uh, concrete. But this material will be reinforced by the geo cell. Let's, uh, let's uh, speak about uh, the mechanism of the geo cell, why it can help uh, to such application. Um, the idea that uh, this is a confinement system so um, any pressure, vertical pressure, which uh, will come on the top of this infill will create shear forces or lateral forces, which will be uh, uh, blocked by the, uh, by the um, walls of the geo cell. So by that you lock the, the material, the infill material, and you matter of fact increase the bearing capacity because you eliminate the shared forces. Uh, secondly, what is important uh, to consider is that uh, this um, uh, compaction and this confinement, once it uh, happens, it should be durable for long term. Uh, and uh, we need to make sure that uh, the strain and uh, it means the value of uh, displacement should be uh, minimal. So there are two types of uh, properties which are very important in order to retain the confinement over time. When uh, this is one cell, but uh, the idea is to uh, create a mattress of many cells, and by that you create a layer which is more stiffer and uh, more durable uh, which can uh, provide the application that we are looking for. Now, uh, there was in the recent years, uh, there was uh, uh, some progress and evolution in the, in the regulation bodies, trying to um, determine the design guideline and the specification of proper uh, geo cell uh, per application. Uh, they started with uh, load support and uh, roads, but many of these uh, requirements and specification also very much uh, applicable to a, a canal uh, protection as well. If I can uh, mention in a brief uh, the main requirements of the regulation bodies, uh, we can mention here uh, three out of uh, four or five requirements, uh, all of them relevant very much to also canal protection. Um, the, this one is a, talks about the tensile force and the tensile stiffness of the wall of the geocell. 
and it determines a specific uh, level of uh, strengths, which should be at least uh, this value. Uh, in matter of fact, uh, we have um, several type of products which uh, uh, categorize according to the stiffness. We don't, we don't uh, specify it according to the thickness rather than according to the uh, stiffness. Stiffness is what is matter, not uh, thickness. And uh, the values are between 16 to 25 kilonewton per meter, which can, uh, and this is very much uh, depends on the application. Uh, if the application is to reinforce uh, a base in a road, it should be much, uh, it should be about around 25 kilonewton per meter. If it is about uh, uh, reinforcing uh, concrete, it can be maybe uh, about uh, 20 kilonewton per meter. Um, another requirement, which is very much uh, reasonable, but uh, always uh, uh, the regular uh, geocell is not so much uh, aware on that, is that uh, the stiffness of the, of the uh, connection, of the weld, uh, welded uh, connection has to be at least in the same value of the, of the strip. Otherwise, you get a, a, a weak point in uh, the confinement. So the confinement has to be complete. It means the stiffness of the weld, as well as the stiffness of the strip has to be more or less balanced. And this is what is mentioned in this uh, requirements of the regulator. Another thing which is very much important, and this is um, relevant for many applications, is the, is the durability. And they specify the durability in terms of uh, displacement over time. And they mention that uh, they mention and determine that uh, assuming that uh, the lifespan uh, of uh, any application is one of the, is uh, one unit or one hundred percent during this time, the the displacement will not exceed more than two uh, percent. In order to retain the confinement and retain all the properties and all the contribution uh, that is accepted uh, and uh, received from this confinement. So you have here a value that is uh, driven by the regulator, and this is what they expect from the specification of the jail set. They talk also about other things. They talk also about uh, the uh, environmental requirements, uh, resistance to oxidation, and, uh, and this is uh, also something which uh, should be discussed, uh, and uh, also other things, but uh, mainly we talk here about uh, what I want to emphasize here is uh, definitely the stiffness of the uh, geocell and, uh, and the durability of it. If we summarize uh, the requirements that we see in the regulation, uh, we can uh, look on these four uh, uh, properties, key properties. So resistance to creep deformation, this is something that I mentioned uh, recently. Uh, this is the test which uh, might apply in order to uh, uh, verify that uh, the, the deformation displacement of the material over long time is acceptable. And uh, I think it was mentioned on the first day by Eric, there are today a, a various type of observation uh, and tests how to verify elongation of material. This, uh, uh, this uh, standard talks about uh, to verify long-term behavior in 24 hours, and I will elaborate about that later on. 
Uh, the, the next one that I can mention here is the tensile strength of the wall of the cell. And this is very important, as I mentioned before, it depends on the application. You might need the various levels of tensile strengths. And uh, definitely there is also here a definition of the test that uh, you might do in the lab in order to verify that uh, the strength of the material is according to the application requirements and the design. The third one is uh, the environment uh, uh, conditions and requirements. Uh, definitely it should be uh, environmental friendly and uh, a solution which is a sustainable solution and uh, it is also defined in this uh, standard uh, the requirements for the resist for oxidation and uh, other things and also there is a specific test that can be done in order to determine that uh, elastic stiffness is uh, very much depends and relevant for um, application in which you need the maintenance in the canal this is elastic uh, stiffness is the ability of the material to withstand uh, a traffic or dynamic uh, stresses. And if uh, you assume a maintenance in the canal, then you would try to also apply these requirements. Otherwise, uh, you can ignore it. Now, um, we have a, a PRS has uh, two types of uh, uh, product lines. One is a product line, which is uh, um, the commodity uh, high density polyethylene. Ziv, I'm sorry to interrupt. Can you, do you think you can finish in the next uh, few minutes? Yes, I think that I'm going to make it shorter because in my Thank you. presentation, we we uh, 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 consolidated all these delays, so I try to manage it uh, shortly. Okay, so in uh, uh, in uh, the design guideline for a geocell in such application, associate with two elements. One is the geometric properties, and the other one is the material properties. In uh, in in canal applications, in the canal application, you have uh, slope protection, which uh, the geometric uh, uh, requirements associated with the flow, the, the, the speed of the flow, and the, uh, and the, and, and the um, uh, steep uh, or angle of uh, slope. Uh, this is the, the um, this is the um, uh, geometric uh, uh, requirements. Now, about the material requirements, uh, definitely, we are looking for a long term and a minimal elongation properties. And definitely, in this case, we shall aim to use the uh, novel polymeric alloy uh, product line that we have, which provide a very low uh, elongation over time. The test that is implemented in order to verify that is uh, the SIM test, STM 6992 which uh, test uh, under specific profile, temperature profile, the behavior of the strip uh, over uh, accelerated time. So only to summarize, this is a behavior. You have here two curves, one which describes the behavior of HDP, the uh, orange. The HDP, we can see that over 50 years, so logarithmic, uh, it can uh, elongate about 10%, while the, the um, tough cell, which is the other uh, product line, will not exceed more than 1% over 100 years. And this is exactly where we are coming from. Utilizing such a geo cell, we can uh, uh, avoid uh, any seepage uh, by tightening the geo cell, tightening the concrete, and avoid any seepage uh, and uh, create imperable solution. Um, 
this is a, um, the last ca one case study that I will show, which we do uh, with our partner in Vietnam, in which we don't use here, these are irrigation canals. We don't use, uh, in this case, we don't need to use a, a German brand. Uh, the solution is a geo cell, a tough cell, which uh, combines with, uh, which uh, uh, confine uh, concrete. And because the durability uh, properties, it does not allow any seepage over a long term. So only to summarize the benefits of, uh, our, uh, of this uh, solution is uh, avoid rebar, rebar, uh, rebar, uh, steel rebars, uh, minimize leakage, a very fast installation. Uh, you don't need the expansion joints. You don't need the rebar bars. It's tolerate with ground movements because you can also increase the bearing capacity by utilizing the gel cell. And uh, it, it minimizes the cracks uh, in the concrete uh, because uh, it's become flexible concrete, which is tight into the confinement system and very much durable solution over, at least from our component, more than 100 years. Okay, so I think that by that, uh, I, I will try to finish uh, this, uh, summarize my uh, presentation, and uh, I will be happy to answer any question about it. Thank you, Ziv. So uh, we need to, 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 to stay on time. We need to, to go right away to with the last presentation by Edwin. And again, please use the Q&A uh, section of Zoom to, to ask any question for Ziv. So uh, next presenter is uh, Edwin Zengering. Edwin was born in, in the Netherlands. He studied civil engineering higher technical school in Hengelo has done several positions at consulting engineer DHV in the Netherlands. He joined Tenkare Geosynetics in 2001 as a technical support engineer for geosynetic materials. He is currently the business development manager for Tenkare Geosystems in the EMEA area, so Europe, Middle East, and Africa. He is responsible for promotion, marketing, and development of projects where Tenkare Geotube systems can be applied. So Edwin, please. Okay, thank you, Eric. Um, hopefully everything is clear and everybody can see uh, my presentation. We see um, and hear. Sorry? We see and hear you very well. Okay, very good, thank you. Um, I'm gonna talk you, with you a little bit about channel bank protection with making use of sand-filled fabricated geosystems. Um, personally, I'm involved a lot with geosystems. I'm uh, the, the, the market manager for these products for Tenkata. Uh, we market those products all over the world. And this sand-filled mattresses is typical product what we use a lot in Asia. Um, I'm gonna show... Uh, just to see how to continue. So um, you know the standard uh, revetment constructions which are available already on a lot of irrigation canals or standard canals. It's a lot of riprap constructions, uh, concrete blocks, uh, rock filled gabions and mattresses. Um, we have seen all kinds of other applications already where also geo mattresses are used, uh, the concrete mattress. But I'm going to show uh, a little bit about the sand filled mattress. Why we propose sand filled mattresses is that with the sand filled mattresses, you can make use of local available materials to fill it inside the mattress. So you don't have to transport huge quantities of materials to the site where you need to uh, protect your bank protection. Um, how is the sand filled mattress uh, being applied? How is it built up? Well, it is uh, built up with two kinds of layers of fabrics. Uh, one at the bottom is most of the times a woven, and the top layer is a uh, composite material. This composite material is a crimple fiber non woven, which is heat treated after it has been stapled with the uh, woven material. And we can uh, fabricate those uh, elements, uh, those, those small tubes in several kinds of uh, circumferences to create also a certain thickness of the mattress that needs to be applied at your structure. Here you can see, for example, a green version uh, where we, we see that a lot in the areas where they want to have green vegetation. Re regarding um, the hydraulic influence of this material, it has not a very good uh, 
uh, manning coefficient. So because you have a lot of uh, uh, rounded areas which could uh, affect the hydraulically flow, but nevertheless it will give you a, a good view of and of the uh, embankment, and it gives you a proper erosion protection of the embankment. Also in areas where there's not a lot of vegetation, we have a sand colored material that can be applied also in other location. Especially if you look in uh, regions like Egypt, where you have a lot of irrigation canals through the sand area, you can make use of these kind of elements. Um, also for pond constructions, you can create uh, protection works for the ponds so that you have a more stable uh, embankment around your pond. Why are these elements used? Uh, well, they are cost effective. You have an easy installation process. It does not need to have uh, heavy machinery for installation. It's a lot of labor work by, by man people. It is a flexible system and it can follow curves and bends quite easily in, uh, in canals. It can be installed in water if required. It can be filled with local sand available. Um, this is a huge advantage because you see the transport of uh, large goods over the over the globe must be reduced a, a much due to the CO2 uh, emissions. Uh, if we can make use of local available sands, uh, let's do that and put that into a mattress so that you can give a protection on your embankment. As mentioned, it has a low carbon footprint. We did in uh, Malaysia a small cost comparison on the different kind of solutions. And this is a typical graph, which is uh, typical for Malaysia. Um, you cannot copy it on the, on the world market because every country have its, country have its uh, specifics on the installation process or the use of materials. So I don't use this as a general rule, but it gives you an indication that the cost can be very compatible with other solutions. How to make a uh, design with these kind of elements? And that's for me a big priority. Uh, we have wrote in 2011, 2012 already a small booklet uh, that's about geosystems design rules and applications. Um, in this booklet, there are uh, calculation methodologies inside for uh, consulting engineers where they can make their design on the mattress or other systems that can be applied. Geosystem is just an, an uh, a name of all kinds of types of geosystems that can be applied. In this uh, calculation model, there are examples inside, so that you can see then how the process is done to determine the, the calculation methodology for what is affecting really on my embankment and how should I calculate the mattress that I would like to use over there. This booklet can be ordered at Francis and Taylor. Um, what are the important input parameters? Uh, for example, you must know the toe level, the crest level, and the still uh, water level. So this will determine then what part will be below the water, what part will be above the water. The revetment slope is of importance, uh, the design flow, and sometimes also design waves, especially if you are calculating on ponds. On ponds, you might have wind waves. Wind waves are affecting also the uh, erosion protection on your uh, slope. So therefore also this waves needs to be taken into consideration. Irrigation canals, most of them are not navigable and therefore you don't have ship waves and those kind of things. Um, so probably there are no wave actions in those structures. In the calculation booklet, there is this calculation rule uh, developed uh, by Pilacic. Uh, in there, you can see uh, how this calculation has been done to determine the thickness of the mattress, what you would want to apply. And the thickness of the mattress, what you want to apply with a sand filled mattress can be uh, divided or de determined by the dimension of the small tubes you are producing. The smaller you make the tube, the smaller the, the, the thickness of the mattress will be. In the design chart, you also must check the KT value. Uh, what, ki what kind of factor of safety do you need to do on uh, turbulent water in turbulent, uh, or, or if you have a higher turbulent, especially in uh, bends, or if you have an example, an, uh, an out 
let of water into the into the canal where you have a huge turbulent and every section can be calculated with a different kt value you can use this graph for determining what kind of factor do i need to do in a certain application the next design sample is the uh, design stability against wave attack and that's much depending on do you have a really waves uh, which are affecting the uh, uh, the sand filled mattress. Uh, we recommend a factor of safety in this kind of structures of four to five and will be determined on the significant wave height determined to the to the thickness of the material. It's a lot of this is depending on the location where you are working on this one. Erosion control through the mattress. Uh, always check the, the sand tightness of the, of the structure. So based on the flow parameter, uh, the Darcy's permeability and the permittivity. Based on that and the uh, uh, factors of, of or the, the O90 of the material, you, you can determine with the calculation of the filter rules how many sand particles could be washed through the textile during the flow in, through uh, the canal. Um, this can be checked uh, on every textile that can be used in this uh, construction, and this should be done in the design process. Also, check uh, the geotechnical stability of the slope. If this slope is not geotechnical stable, and you place a mattress on top of it, the mattress will not help uh, to increase the stability of this uh, mattress, of this slope. Then, you start installing a, a sand mattress. We always recommend uh, make at the top of the slope a small anchor trench uh, to anchor the mattress in the, in the trench. And um, this should be high enough to, uh, to locate it above the st still water line, of course, and also check the wave run up limit. At the bottom, there are several protection possibilities. You can do it with some fill material, what you place at the bottom. You can use a tube over there. You can use riprap with a non-woven underneath there, or for example, a concrete beam to block up your uh, sand-filled mattress. The sand-filled mattress can be adopted also to the areas where you have outlets or inlets. It can be formed quite easily on the wings of the concrete structures so that you have a good proper connection between those two elements that should give protection to your embankment. Based on the, the design of all the design rules, what you have date, you can determine then the product which should be used for building up the sand filled mattress. And you check then the standard uh, uh, geosynthetic parameters, what you can put in your specification. And you can do these things in your specification for tender, which goes out to the contractor later on. Here you can see some installation of the sandfield mattress. Here we installed a non-woven underneath the, the sandfield mattress to avoid erosion through the pores because we had a sandy bottom area. And uh, here you can see the trench, which is prepared for uh, anchoring the system at the slope, at the top of the slope. The, the small mattresses are installed in panels. They are connected with each other and uh, the people then insert a small funnel to create uh, or to fill up hydraulically the mixture of sand and water inside of the small tubes. The sand filled mattress can also easily adopt uh, small curvatures and in corners you can make a small connection up or proper connection between the mattresses in the corner. Here you see the filling process. The filling process is a lot of labor work. It's always done with, uh, with some people. Uh, with a mixture of sand and water, sand will be pushed into a small hopper and with water, you flush it inside of the tube and then you can fill up your whole uh, sand filled mattress. Here you see this small funnel, what they use over here. It's installed at the top of the toe, of the top of the slope. And there you, with a mixture of sand and water, you flush it inside of the small tube. And in the end, you'll have a nicely protected um, embankment of a canal or a uh, small pond. This was for me, my presentation.
Uh, if there are some further questions, I'm here to answer. You can also send an email to me and I will come back to this, uh, to your questions. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, very instructive presentation. Uh, it looks like we have a sand field structure, a concrete field structure, concrete uh, refabricated uh, material, geocell filled with either concrete or soil. We have many, many different options. Yep. So that's uh, very interesting. So we have uh, several questions to, to, to address. The first one actually is not a question, it's more a comment. It's from uh, Ahmed Shauki from the World Bank. So I'm going to read his comment that he's put on the, on the Q&A uh, uh, section. I am so pleased to participate in this important webinar as I've been working with Hervé and Eric, Hervé Puskelec and Eric, so that's myself, on the topic of canal lining which often costs 75% of the cost of IFI financed uh, uh, irrigation projects. So we need to ensure A, durability and cost effectiveness of the lining technology, and B, the intended impact on the water balance through undertaking water accounting as part of the project design. I'm at World Bank. So thank you, Ahmed, for your support. It's, uh, it's indeed a very, very interesting uh, topic. Uh, as Will highlighted again in his presentation, the water situation in the world is, uh, is going to be capturing a lot of energy from many people, and we're happy to help overall. Um, so the next question would be for uh, Will. Uh, somebody said that an, an agent of, uh, has, um, has indicated that concrete canvas has a lifespan of only three months. What is the real life of the mattress? So I think you have to answer that yourself. Canvas. Yeah, so um, obviously uh, understanding the life of uh, new composite materials like GCCMs and GCCBs um, is quite complicated. Um, Geomembranes and geotextiles have been around for a long time, so that they're, they're relatively well understood. So our approach to assessing the lifespan of um, GCCMs has been to look at the individual components and, and the key criteria is how the concrete ages and typically the, the, the most aggressive forms of um, aging for concrete are, are the impact of things like heat rain and freeze thaw. So for, for our GCCMs they undergo many cycles of um, free store so we've, we've done up to 200 cycles and then we do them to um, far in excess of the standard temperature range so from plus to minus 20 we've gone to plus and minus 50 um, and that means for for gccms in erosion control applications um, we have bba um, certification up to 120 years where we're using them as barriers then we refer to the European norms, so the guidance within the European norms for barriers. So depending on which barrier has been um, used as the liner on the GCCM, uh, it can be anything up to up to 50 years based on, uh, I think it's typically mic microbiological aging effects for membranes. And Eric, this is very much an area of your expertise, um, but we basically refer to international standards for, for the membranes and then look at concrete age processes to the concrete component. Okay, so three months is a hard mistake to start with. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, am I correct thinking that the formulation of your concrete differs a little bit uh, or significantly actually from regular concrete that you use for uh, buildings and uh, yes. roads? Yes, yes, absolutely. So typically within um, concrete that's used in high mass structures, um, you would have fairly large aggregate sizes. So obviously where we're using um, GCCMs with thicknesses down as low as five millimeters, we, we, you, you can't have aggregates of anywhere near that size. So we, we use a very carefully formulated cement chemistry, um, very, very high compressive strengths so is typically we're getting up to 80 MPA and no large particles within there. And, and that allows us to get to these very um, long durabilities. And, and it's the density as well that's, that's really key in these products um, because it's the density of the powder fill that controls the water to powder ratio 
And with any concrete product, it's that water to powder ratio, which is going to be critical to getting the long term strength. So you can use the the 24 hour flex strength or the 28 day compressive strength as a really good indication for what the long term durability is going to be, because that will that will be influenced very heavily by the density, uh, which controls effectively the water to powder fill. OK. So that, uh, that answers quite precisely. Uh, there was, um, okay, uh, w there is other questions for you, but I'm just gonna read them as they, they come. Uh, th I think that would be for Simon. Uh, how do you ensure that concrete pumped into the concrete mattress is uniformly distributed? Um, so yeah, this all stays and falls with the amount of inlets placed on the mattress and uh, with the type of concrete chosen. So we need uh, highly fluid concrete. Uh, it's recommended to have at least uh, a concrete, um, F6 class concrete, which is, uh, let's say, has a slump of 63 centimeters. Or better than that would be a, a self-compacting concrete, which usually has a slump of uh, more than 73 centimeters. So in the end of the day, the concrete distribution stays and falls with the uh, yeah with the concrete quality chosen. And um, I mean, you can influence this a little bit by uh, the arrangement of the inlet. So when you are not able to fill with the with the concrete you have on site, you either try to make it more liquid on site, or you arrange more inlets on site. This is also possible. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question was again about the durability, but it has been responded already. Um, next one, Simon again. Mm -hmm. uh, how are the mattresses joined one to the other? So uh, there are two different possibilities. Um, first of all, you can either uh, have them in pre-assembled panels, so that means they are stitched together in the in the uh, in the production facilities and then supplied uh, on site. So that means they are con connected by by stitching. Uh, by by sewing machine, uh, layer wise, so bottom layer to bottom layer, top layer to bottom, uh, uh, top layer to top layer, bottom layer to bottom layer, and um, those panels, um, which can have sizes up to one thousand square meters, can be then connected by zippers. So that means uh, each panel has them bottom on the bottom layer a zipper and on the top layer a zipper, uh, which can be then connected to the next panel. Um, the other possibility would be to to have on site stitching. This means uh, the material comes in, uh, in the full mill width on site and uh, will be connected on site by uh, stitching machines, by hand stitching machines. Okay, so it's different options for different yeah. configurations. Uh, next question, uh, I think that goes back to Will. Uh, during application, more than 10% dry powder is lost, uh, which reduces the weight by about 10, 12 to 15%. Uh, I think that is about the GCCM. Uh, does it mean it loses that much strength uh, while application is in process? So first, 10% uh, dry powder uh, lost. Is it uh, something correct? That, I mean, there's something going wrong with the GCCM if you're losing that level of dry, dry powder. So um, when you when you cut the, the product, there can be a small amount of dry powder that's lost from the edge. So typically we say if you're you're cutting the product, you should have a sacrificial sort of 20 to 50 millimeters at the edge. So that just means leaving a little bit extra in your anchor trench. But we very carefully control the surface material, which is effectively your, your filtration layer, which ensures that you don't lose um, dry powder fill during the deployment process. There may, may be a small amount of dust as with any um, concreting activity. Um, but it's really important, you know, there's, there's something not, not right. And I suggest you're, you're not using a GCCM made by, made, made by us. So maybe it's from another company that's not controlling the filtration layer, uh, but it's really important. You don't get large levels of powder fill because that will affect the density. The only, only place that can happen is at the edge when you're cutting on site and you would then just leave a sacrificial uh, few centimeters to account for that. Okay, so it's really, a a design, a product design issue, the external layer of the of the GCCM that will control this loss, and the well-designed product. Uh, yeah. Does it reflect in the specification in the in the way in, in some way, or is it something that uh, people must do some trial tests? Or how can they assess between different suppliers? Yeah. So actually, um, one of the things that has recently been developed is a compressive strength test for GCCMs, and part of that 
The key thing within that is to determine the water to powder ratio, because when you're doing a compressive cube test, you need to cast your cube to the right uh, water to powder ratio. Um, so you have to first of all determine it in the fabric form. And prior to doing that, there's a manipulation test within the ASTM, which means that there's a, ha there's a certain amount of handling that has to happen. And that's the di designed to, um, to reflect the sort of handling that would happen on site so that any of those impacts would be captured within the ASTM when you're doing the, the lab test. Thank so that, that's, that's the, the one place it's captured within the specification standard. Okay. So another question, uh, there wasn't a question, uh, question, but the availability of the recordings and all the slides. So uh, all the speakers who accept to deliver their slides, uh, uh, we will, uh, the IGS will make the slides available through the IGS website. website. And for the, the recording, as, long, as soon as we have the acceptance of the, all the speakers, they will be made available as well. Uh, next question, uh, what is the comparable Manning's roughness coefficient when considering traditional concrete technologies? I am not sure exactly to who this is uh, addressed. Uh, I would assume uh, Simon, uh, I'm not 100% sure. Or maybe, um, uh, maybe Paolo actually, about roughness coefficient. Well, I think if it's about roughness, uh, I think there are, say, uh, fairly clear data in literature from the old days and uh, hydraulics of open channels uh, uh, from the Vente Child book. And uh, we basically have uh, from research values in uh, already coded. So in 0 0.03, 0 0.033 something, and that's typically the Manning's factor that is used. Um, one thing that I mentioned uh, um, that I actually uh, did not touch on my presentation, or at least I showed, but uh, for lack of time, obviously we couldn't go through this. Um, I addressed the deforestation problem, desertification issue is of course another issue of very much importance. And um, for this, structures like in Rockfield or anything, you know, like Gibbons mattresses can also be combined with the geosynthetics at the bottom. So to prevent, uh, let's say, the seeping flow to go through or in and out. Okay, so this was one as actually this is one of the answers. Uh, one of the questions that I was asked by one of the attendees, uh, I'd like to mention this for the benefit of, of the community, of course, because of course, this is an important point. Uh, in case it was for Simon, Simon, would you have something to add because maybe of the shape of the... Mm -hmm. I, I, I mean, uh, so we have different types of mattresses. Um, so the uniform section mattress um, I was showing in the ceiling, uh, in the canal ceiling applications. We have uh, tested these, uh, the Mannings N in, N in the lab, and this is for the filled mattress of uh, 0.015. So it's quite smooth still. Okay. In case it was a more generic, Pietro, maybe you want to add something about the impact of the different technologies, geosynthetics technologies or concrete field uh, on the Manning coefficient? <clears throat> yes, uh, thanks. Ed. I was just raising my hand to, to add ah. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, I think that uh, uh, the, the um, roughness coefficient is uh, uh, an important uh, design parameter. Uh, as uh, also uh, we heard yesterday, uh, there are situations where uh, a, a very smooth surface is desirable uh, to, to increase the water flow. Uh, so in this case, you need a very low uh, roughness coefficient uh, and uh, uh, there are materials that uh, allow uh, Manning coefficient even less than 0, 0, 0.02. Uh, there are other situations where uh, the, the slipness of the, of the surface is a disadvantage because it can trap uh, animals, uh, prevent uh, uh, movement of, uh, of people from one side to the other. So it's better to have a higher uh, roughness coefficient and then decrease the flow. Uh, the, uh, there is another important uh, design uh, consideration. 
uh, that I no, no, no time to, to show the, the different design method, but particularly when you have uh, a vegetated bank. Uh, the, uh, the design uh, shall be uh, carried out in two limit conditions. One, just at the end of construction, when you have the minimum roughness uh, of the surface. And then at the long term, where uh, the vegetation is grown or there is some uh, uh, damages uh, uh, or some uh, um, uh, intrusion in the, in, the, in the surface that decrease the roughness coefficient. So usually you have the highest flow just at the end of the construction, but then you have to consider the long term hydraulic condition where the flow can decrease. So both conditions should be uh, verified. And uh, I think that there are some uh, system where the, uh, the roughness will not change uh, for, for many, many years. Other than, uh, especially if you, uh, the, uh, the vegetation of the bank is an important issue also for environmental impact and so on. Uh, and then uh, there is a difference between uh, uh, the, the flow at the beginning and the uh, long term. Yeah, okay, so it's a much more, there is no uh, specific answer. I see that, Paolo, you want to, to add some information. Yes, I actually was curious because the presentation, of course, uh, gave us an opportunity to take a look at different technologies to use for, for seepage control. And um, it, it's very interesting. I wanted to know if, uh, say, to the, to the speakers who have uh, described the concrete field uh, structures, if there is um, in the evaluation or in the design anything concerning the drainage, um, I'm, I'm thinking of uh, combining a rigid and an impermeable structure uh, to a natural soil. So when, when I'm combining these two functions, which are completely different, one is erodible, one is not erodible, one is, uh, you know, movable in, in terms, in general terms, and one not. So is there any transition layer that you have taken into account? That was my first. Second question is, what do you do for design? Um, so what are, in this case, the conditions for you to decide whether you need this thickness, this thickness, or this thickness? Um, may I start? Go ahead. Okay, so um, to answer your first question, um, so it's, I mean, as long as the, 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 the subsoil is not prone to settle and uh, just needs to pro be protected against erosion, um, it's not an issue, as I've shown in the in the example from Italy, uh, to place uh, directly on top uh, a mattress without any intermediate layer. I mean, what of course needs to needs to be uh, 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 determined uh, or checked in advance is that there is no, let's say, groundwater flow or something else. Uh, let's say water flowing underneath the the layer, which may lead to erosion. So that I have, let's say bridging effects of the of the concrete revetment which may then fail in the end of the day so what i need to make sure is that they that they have a sufficient um anchorage on top which avoids uh, uh surface runoff to be let's say let's say flown underneath the mattress and um if there is any let's say groundwater movements underneath i can apply a filter let's say like a granular filter or also a, a, a non-woven for example, in order to yeah to stop those yeah those flows uh, in between the mattress and the uh, and the subsoil. Um, the second uh, part of your question about the thickness. Um, in general, uh, the thickness um, is depending on the hydraulic load or on the wave load uh, we have to deal with. Um, I mean, uh, when we are talking about navigable canals to be uh, yeah lined or to be protected against erosion. When we are talking about uh, anchor fault protection, we need at least, uh, according to German standards, a thickness of 20 centimeters um, of the concrete mattress. And um, when we just want to seal, let's say, a section like I've shown in the Munich uh, uh, example, where we where we are, were talking about the Mittlere Isar Canal, it has a, had a, a thickness of 10 centimeters because it was sitting on top of a, on a on place a concrete revetment. 
um, and just needs to, uh, yeah, let's say, guarantee the, yeah, the impermeability of the system. So that means uh, either um, we have uh, high flow or we have mechanical protection, then we need thicker elements. Other than that, we can always take, let's say, thickness around 10, 15 centimeters. It's, it's more than sufficient, usually, for, for sealing applications. OK, thank you. Um, if I may, one last question, then I'll keep quiet. <laughs> it's for Edwin this time. Uh, very curious to see the sand field. Um, I'm wondering about durability of the textile. Uh, do you have any testing specifically to ensure that the, the durability of the geotextile over a long time will, will still be sufficient to hold the, the sand? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the textile from itself, it's a standard geosynthetics, which has a 100-year lifetime. But uh, you have, of course, UV exposure on top. And therefore, we have this crimple um, non-woven layer, what we put on top of that. This is specially treated with uh, UV stabilizers, which gives you a protection of more than 50 years. It's a durability question for plastics. They are always dominant in any discussions. But we put plastic on everything we want to last. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Pietro, you had raised your hand as well. Yes, um, just uh, uh, one more uh, consideration about uh, uh, the problem raised by Paolo. Uh, Alberto Squero yesterday uh, said clearly then when uh, you place a, an impermeable lining, uh, most of the time you need a drainage system uh, behind the, the, the uh, impermeable uh, uh, liner. Be and this occurs also in, uh, uh, in uh, uh, canals because uh, uh, it, there are situations, uh, I have experience of it, where the canal cut through uh, a soil with high water table uh, or a uh, water table with uh, uh, different uh, levels uh, on the air. So uh, there there may be situations where the, the, the pressure below the, the lining shall be um, uh, designed with a, a drainage system to, to, to avoid uh, uh, overpressure. So uh, in this situation, uh, uh, just remind that uh, there are geosynthetic for drainage that are purposely engineered for that uh, uh, application. So sometimes the, the, uh, the design for waterproofing or erosion control shall be uh, uh, coupled with the design for drainage. And there are also uh, product and design method for that. Thank you. So uh, it's already 11.20. Well, it's, it's getting late, so we need to progress with the questions. Uh, there was a question on pricing for Will. Uh, Will, do you want to address pricing, or maybe that's a private uh, answer? I, I mean, I'm uh, happy, happy to talk to anyone who's got a project, and uh, we would need to understand, you know, what's yeah. the application, and then we okay. can determine the product type and obviously quantities. So uh, yeah. de delight, delighted if there's a there's some projects out there. Um, please, please come and talk to yeah. us. I think that's not something to, to, to discuss at, at this stage uh, right here. Uh, next, question, next question is for Ziv. Uh, how can the issue of shrinkage be addressed when filling the geocell with concrete? The issue of what? Uh, can you repeat? Shrinkage. Um, uh, shrinkage of concrete, I, I suppose. I suppose so, yeah. Um, uh, as far as uh, uh, I concern or we concern, uh, usually the idea is uh, to avoid the uh, expansion uh, of uh, any uh, infill material, whether it is uh, gravel or, or, or concrete. Um, we cannot uh, avoid the uh, shrinkers, but most of the cases in which we face is uh, about uh, expansion uh, due to uh, hydraulic forces or any other load, external load. So usually the, the, the phenomena is uh, shear forces which uh, create lateral forces and expand the infill material rather than shrinking. 
Okay, so uh, another question for you is, uh, what is the recommended anchoring method for concrete filled geocells when placed on top of impermeable membranes since the normal anchoring stakes cannot be placed through the membrane? So what would be yes. your recommendation for that? Uh, yes, um, usually when we use uh, such uh, uh, impermeable uh, elements like uh, geomembrane, uh, the idea is to use a dead man uh, on the top and uh, and uh, create uh, anchoring which uh, does not uh, use any uh, uh, anchors uh, to punch uh, the the, the uh, geotextile or the geomembrane. Okay, so without any stake, the DNA. We use we use also sometimes we use also tens tendons which uh, can uh, be inserted into the gel cell. Uh, we prepare certain oils which uh, can allow to the tendons to come in and by that we uh, create uh, the anchorage, the tendons. Okay, next question uh, was about the Manning coefficient uh, and I think we've discussed that relatively extensively. Uh, so, uh, uh, another question, again for Ziv, actually. Uh, with the most recent material, uh, NPA, is a geomembrane needed to obtain an excellent seepage control? So do you need to have a geomembrane under the, the geocell filled with concrete? Or do you think the geocell filled with concrete is sufficient to provide a seepage control? The, the idea that uh, by utilizing the NPA geocell, uh, uh, you and its uh, matter of fact uh, creep properties, you can uh, eliminate the necessity to use a, a liner, HDP liner, uh, and you can exceed and achieve uh, the seepage uh, avoidance and the probability capability by the geo cell only. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the next question, I, I think that's for Edwin. Uh, are any anchor required to hold the mattress while on high flood on or higher water current? So I think it's about the hydraulic limits yes. of the... Yeah. yeah, of course. If you uh, install this mattress in a high flow, you need to anchor it. And therefore you can use anchor pins or hairpins to push it against uh, or through the, the fabric at the, the sides where you have sued it you can uh, place the pins inside of the anchoring wall of the, or the slope uh, so that you anchor your mattress. So additional and, anchoring yeah, is possible. Yeah, and it's, and it's a lot depending on the length of the slope, of course. If the slope is uh, around five meters, you don't need any anchorage. But if the slope is around 20 to 40 meters, it, you need some anchorage. Thank you. Uh, last question, and we are getting close to 11.30, so I think it's, uh, it's, it's going to be the last one. Uh, that's for Will. Uh, a less than one centimeter thick concrete is very fragile. I have in hand sample of GCCM, which is extremely hard. Uh, could you comment? Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, good question. I mean, I think this is a, a, a great example of the beauty of composite materials. So obviously, if you have what, a one centimeter of conventional um, concrete without any reinforcement, uh, concrete is very good in compression, uh, very very brittle in bending. So you will, won't get any bending strength out of conventional concrete at that thickness. I think this is the beauty of this new class of geosynthetic is that we're combining the properties of concrete. We're reinforcing them with polymeric fibers. So it's the fibers which act as the tensile reinforcement within within the concrete and that means that we can get these very very high high performance um, compressive strengths flexural strengths out of only a few millimeters of material so it's the combination of the durability and the compressive strength of concrete with the tensile strength of uh, the fibers which are embedded within the GCCM. And obviously that needs to be done in a very carefully controlled manufacturing environment, which means you get the, the densities and the water to powder ratios that I mentioned earlier. And, um, and, and then you can get these very, very hard, very high flexural strength um, materials, um, which, are, which are GCCMs and GCCBs. Thank you. So I think it's time to close for the 
for this session, for the third day to close the, the series of webinar uh, entirely. Uh, I think it was really very instructive and also we had uh, a few slides showing how cost effective those the solutions are compared to pretty much any uh, other concrete applications, uh, concrete or other solutions for bank stabilization. So I hope that leads to further interaction between people listening to the webinar and the people, uh, the speakers. And in the, in the meantime, I have to thank everybody, all the speakers, for giving extraordinary presentation, very good, and uh, all the attendants for being there. We had a very good attendance, by the way. Uh, I'm very happy with that as well. So thank you, and uh, I look forward for the next opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, too. Bye-bye.